Hello and welcome to this video, this, this talk through of a mock exam. I'm going to be talking through the 2018 R012 paper, which is available on the OCR website. This is in public domain, this isn't a locked paper. And I'm just going to talk you through this to try and show you what the question says and, and what the question requires you to answer. After each question, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to think about what you would put yourself, to maybe discuss it with somebody next to you, or to write down your answer. That way you can then cross-reference with what the actual answer is and, and have a bit more understanding when I talk through the paper itself. So then, let's get started. Question one. You are working on a project and need to set milestones. In which phase of the project lifecycle would this task be carried out? One mark available for this. Have a think. What phase would this be carried out? Well, there are actually two phases that you could write here. It could be carried out in the initiation phase or the planning phase. As you know from doing your coursework and from doing past paper questions and learning about the project lifecycle, setting milestones could happen at the very beginning when you're beginning to think about what the project is. And it can also be done when you start doing things like your Gantt chart in the planning stage. So, did you get a mark for that? Did you put the right one down? If you didn't, make sure you write the right answer. Question two. This figure, figure one below, shows parts of a Gantt chart. And we can see here that we've got a column, which has got an A in it, so we don't really know what that is. Then we've got start date, duration, and then some hours here. Okay, What does column A represent? What would you write? Remember, you want a third party to pick this up and to be able to use it and understand your Gantt chart. So what would you write here? Well, you could write activities or you could write tasks. You could write task list. But you're looking for something very clearly to say that these are the tasks that need to be carried out. Question number three. Identify one software type that could be used to create a visual diagram. Identify one software type that could be used to create a visual diagram. Okay, so you've got multiple options here, okay? And you can write sometimes in you can write in trade names such as Microsoft, whatever, but I would always advise that you try and use the the actual software type rather than a trade name, just in case the mark scheme says do not accept trade names and you don't get that mark. So you could have DTP, desktop publishing software, so something like Microsoft Publisher. You could have presentation software such as Microsoft PowerPoint or Google Slides. You could have some sort of art packages uh, that are available to you such as Google SketchUp or something like that or other CAD related uh, software. Just be careful if you do DT and you know of a CAD or CAM related software and you write it down there. If the examiner doesn't know what you're talking about because it's too specialised you might not get the mark. And you could use word processing software, uh, which is which is arguable, uh, but the mark scheme does say you can use word processing software. It isn't what I would choose, and I also think that that doesn't really lend itself well to the uh, application software uh, outlines that we've seen in R012 learning, but you can have the mark for it if you put that there. Okay, question number four. We're going up to two marks now. A food manufacturer is using a consumer panel to collect feedback on its range of healthy snacks give two advantages of a consumer panel to collect this feedback two advantages so two marks two advantages one mark for each let's write down what you're going to put okay so a couple of the advantages you might have had better quality feedback or more detailed feedback more accurate you could have had opinions given by people who have used the product feedback and the product feedback is therefore more informed. Longer interviews are possible if required or you could have said more questions could be asked to clarify the person's understanding. Cross section of consumers are invited, different ages, demographics and, and a broader range of people are invited to do it so therefore you get a better range of data. Better engagement as the people who have done the uh, the actual survey are volunteers, so they want to do it. And you're allowed to see what the facial reactions are of the people. Okay. What I can't accept is it's easy to collect feedback, or the process is quicker, or that it is more accurate than others. What I can't accept is it's cheaper, or that it's free. 
So please be careful when you put things down that are quite broad. Remember that ease and cheaper and less expensive or quicker are all subjective. Somebody might find it easier, correct, but some people might not. So be really careful about putting down those broad examples there. Remember what I always say. You need to give an answer that shows that you've done the learning for this course rather than you're just some random person who has been stopped in the street and asked a consumer panel where you invite people in to give their feedback. What would be the advantage of that? If anybody can answer it, giving your answer, you've got to start thinking, have I actually done the learning for this course or not? So just be careful about giving those broad answers. Question number five. Farming, spelt with a PH, is one type of threat that exists when collecting data online. What is meant by the term farming? Two marks, so it's looking for a point and then an explanation. Point and explanation for two marks. Have a go at that, please. Okay, you could have to steal data or personal information through the use of a fake website. So you get one mark to steal personal information or steal data, and then you get the second mark for explaining how that would be done. You could have had to redirect people from a legitimate website to a fake website, which will then lead to them stealing data. So you get one mark for redirection, you get one mark for taking somebody from a real website to a fake website, or you get a mark for saying steal data, but the steal data has to be in there. And then you could have had to read out rep, web, rep users to a fake website without their knowledge so it looks the same. Or anything like that. You could have had something like an example in there or you could have said somebody goes on to a website such as PayPal and it takes them to a fake version of PayPal the user doesn't realise and then they steal the data. That would give you two marks as well. Okay, question number six. You were releasing a deliverable product to a client. During which phase of the project lifecycle does this task play, take place? common one this where people lose a mark it's not asking you when the deliverable product is created it's asking you when it is released and the answer is evaluation your deliverable product is released in the evaluation phase after you've done the testing and the evaluation it is not released in the execution phase Okay, question number seven. A retailer shares information about new products with its store managers using voice over internet protocol, VOIP or VoIP, depending on where you're from. Describe one advantage to the retailer of using VOIP to share this information. Two marks. Okay, I'm going to start off now with what I can't accept, and you'll, you'll realise a quick trend here. I can't accept that it is easier, that it is faster, that it is easier to set up, or that it is cheaper. They are all subjective. Okay, so you cannot write that. What you could have written were, were you can hear the voice of the other person on the end of the phone. You can hear their voice to understand what the product is. You can show them the product with a camera. There is an opportunity of two-way dialogue to increase understanding. You can get, you can use a wide range of mobile devices, meaning that it is more flexible method. Less hardware in the building, uh, as some use cabling and some use voice over Ethernet, so that's a, an advantage. It allows for group calls that allow sharing of information with more than one store manager at a time, making communication more efficient. There is a no marginal extra cost if paying for the data is already at a flat fee is the final option that you could have put there. Remember, it's more about what you can say here. So it's explaining the fact that, yes, those answers that you give where you say it is cheaper or it's easier to set up, they might make sense, but you need to give it to the context, okay? So this is talking about store managers. So let's think about a store. Let's think about JD Sports. JD Sports have a new product line. They can use VOIP for uh, head office to talk to all store managers in that area and give a demonstration of the product and what they want the window display to look like. That is more efficient, more ti less time consuming and probably if they've already got an internet service provider not going to cost them any extra f amount of money to just do it over VOIP rather than sending one rep out to every store in that area to give a demonstration, show them what it looks like one store at a time so that's what it's looking for it's looking for your ability to relate it back to this little bit of a scenario here all right then so now we've got this scenario and this scenario is one that you've probably seen before and then you've got some questions 
relating to this scenario later on. So, a project team has been set up to organise the installation of a cashless system in the school canteen over the summer holiday. The new payment system must be ready for the first day of term. The school has a budget of £20,000 to set up the new system. There will be two checkouts, each with a barcode scanner, a fingerprint reader will be used to identify each student at the checkout. When a student wants to buy a meal, they will take the items to the checkout, sign in with their fingerprint and scan the food item barcodes. The total cost will be calculated and displayed on a touchscreen. The student will then confirm the purchase by clicking the OK button. The student can also cancel their purchase if the meal costs too much. The system will generate a total bill at the end of each week and this is sent to the student's home by email. This sounds remarkably familiar, doesn't it, to what we use in school, and so this shouldn't be anything of a surprise to you. Now, what the first question is, it's one mark, it says, what is one input of the initiation phase for this project? One input of the initiation phase for this project. Notice it says this project, not just one input of the initiation phase. And so it is looking for you to be able to identify one input into the initiation phase related to this project. So you could have had user, school, or client requirements. The user, school, or school constraints or boundaries. The business case. The resources. And you could have given some examples of the resources to gain a mark. Okay? We could have accepted collection of ideas for what the user wants, but I would have liked you to have said there that that would be the school or the client's requirements. All right, question number B then. Identify one output from the planning phase for this project. So think about outputs that you know come in the planning phase and see how you could relate them to this project. All right then, so you could have had project plan, test plan, constraints list, or phase review. The, the outputs of the planning phase remain the same no matter what the project is. Okay, and so it was a little bit of a trick there where it said for this project, and you might have over tried to complicate that, but all it needs is for you to out state one of the outputs for the planning phase. All right then, question number nine. The project manager considers legislative implications during the initiation and planning phase. Describe one legislative implication that may, must be considered for this project. A legislative implication is the law. So one legal implication, one act, one piece of law or legislation that you know that could impact on this project. And you need to describe it. So you need to state it and then you need to explain it, please. And no surprise here, as it says very clearly at the top, that essentially they're taking a lot of data from people. You need to state that this is going to be the D GDPR or the Data Protection Act. And your explanation, your description needs to state that as personal data is being used, the data must be protected. Or personal data must be protected, which is a requirement by law. Or the school must make sure that data is up to date to meet the legal requirements. Or it must comply with the legal requirements as involves personal data. Essentially, GDPR has got six strands and the Data Protection Act has got eight strands. You could take any one of those and then elaborate on it and just talk about how data must be protected because of that and explain it a little bit more. Okay? It says here, the answer must be based on the scenario. Where an answer is clearly not based on a scenario, no walks, no marks, sorry, can be available or awarded to the candidate. So you must relate it back to the scenario, otherwise you're not going to get that mark. The team will follow the project lifecycle to complete this project. Discuss the advantages to the school of the project being completed using the project life cycle. Eight marks. Let's take our time. Let's think about this. I want you to have a think about how you can explain the advantages to the school of following the project life cycle when developing the cashless payment system. You need to be giving your answer in context, okay? You need to be thinking about what is completed in the project life cycle, what phases are in the project life cycle, and how each of them will be of benefit to the school for the completion of this 
project. Have a go, see what you come out with. I'm now going to read through what's called the indicative content. This is the content in the mark scheme that we should be looking for, okay? But it doesn't by any means restrict you to this. So there might be scope for you to, uh, to get marks still if you haven't put this in. So, one positive is that financial resources can be allocated in advance so that the school can plan spending and keep within its budget. If you've put something like that, then brilliant. Another one is that phase reviews can take place, meaning that the school will be able to see the progress being made and see that the project is on schedule. This will increase the confidence that the school has that the cashless payment system will be delivered on time. You need to put something in there about phase reviews, that, that these phase reviews allow the, the end user, in this case the school, to be able to see how things are progressing. Another thing you could have put is that the feasibility report produced by the project team will allow the school to abandon or postpone the project after the initiation phase if it will not be possible to deliver the cash flow payment system within the time or financial constraints. Now you might have elaborated on that. They want it to be done in the six week holidays and they've got a 20 grand budget. So you might have put that in there and that's fine as well. You need to have related it back to the school though. Okay. And the, the another option would be that the project team will have created or agreed project and test plans. So the school will know what will be delivered, when will it be delivered, what it'll look like, what it's gonna do. So they're not gonna be blind going into this. And you will also maybe or should have written that a recognized series of steps to help organize a project will be undertaken. Now I'm gonna just read you what needs to be done for the top mark band. And it says, candidate explains the advantages to the school of following the project life cycle when developing the CACRAS payment system. The answer must be given in context. Now, to get the bottom of this mark band, so six marks out of eight, you need to have given more than one advantage and explain them in a reasonable depth for each of the advantages. So that's for six marks. To get eight marks, you need to have gone that little bit further. Okay. To get three marks, you need to have just done one advantage and one description. Okay. Uh, and that's going to give you about five marks. For three marks, you give a weak description to one advantage. So that's going to give you three marks. If you want to get the one and two marks, which hopefully none of you do, uh, you need to be able to just give a one advantage but no descriptions. And if you just get one mark, that means that you've just made a point, but you haven't done anything with it. If you've just waffled on and you've made no points, no descriptions, you'll get zero marks, but that's unlikely. You're likely to get one or two marks and then pushing up. The key here is that you need to have discussed them. So you need to have made a point and then you need to have explained them every single time and in a good depth of understanding. Okay, so scrolling down now, question number 11. Identify two constraints to this project. Remember we're talking about the school sales, so two constraints to that project. Have a look, see what you'd write. Okay, so two constraints. Constraints lists are always the same. So you've got time, resources, security, risk management, budget, money or finances, staff expertise and legislation. They are the same constraints for every single project and you just need to have explained two. As always with these exams, you need to then have taken one of those and given a description to show your understanding. So it says, for one of the constraints you've chosen in part A, describe one step that could be taken to mitigate this. That means that essentially riding on this now is your answers to the beginning. If you haven't done the right answers there, then you're not going to do the right answer here. So many of, of the candidates who I have marked over the years write the wrong answer here, then write the wrong answer here and the wrong description, and they lose these two marks and that other mark there. So these three marks out of a possible four. Okay, so just be careful with what you write there, and then make sure you write here a good description. And your description can be really, really detailed. It doesn't need to just enter into this. You can go on the space below. Remember the marker has to write, read everything that you have written. So if we take, for example, uh, time, you could have written that task schedules can be carefully planned to create uh, Gantt charts or other equivalent charts to follow the project life cycle. So there's a lower risk of dis delays to deliver the project on time. Uh, you could have also had that time contingency can be built into the project so that the delivery of the system to the school will not be delayed. For resources, you could have had a cost contingency can be built into the project to prevent overspend. I'm not going to read through all of these because essentially if you've written one of those correct constraints up there and then you've explained how that will work for this project, you've got the two marks. Interestingly, it says do not award answers that suggest that checking that the constraint exists is a method of mitigation. You're looking for this mitigation here, how it can be avoided. So simply saying, oh, uh, time is my chosen constraint description. 
checking that, that I'm working on time mitigates this. That's not good enough. They want to see how you can build in contingency, build in methods, build in processes to prevent that constraint from becoming a problem. Okay? All right, another scenario here for question number 12. So, question number 12 to 15 are all based on this scenario, so we've got to read it very carefully, and it's one that you've probably seen before. An athletics club, Progress Harriers, organises a monthly competition. The competition includes a variety of sporting events. The results of the competition are posted on the club's website and sent to all competitors in an email attachment. Progress Harriers uses a database to store and process data such as event results club event records and the contact details of each competitor. The database is stored on a laptop and the database is protected by a password. At the start of each monthly competition, the, co the laptop is used by club officials to record the names of the comp competitors in a database table. During each competition, a desk is set up at the side of the event field where the competition is being held. The results of each sporting event are brought by club officials to the desk. This data on the position and the time of each competitor is input into the database using a laptop. Right, before we go any further, hopefully your brain is going, again, like the previous one, oh, this makes sense, this is something I've seen. None of you need to be a, a part of an athletics club, none of you need to be a part of uh, a running team or anything like that. You've all been a part of a sports day, and this is what the sports day is. There's a sports day tent, and in that tent, someone sits there and they take the details down that are taken to them, and people do these events and they put it into a laptop and then the laptop is used by several people. You should be able to picture this right now because you've all been to a sports day before. So please get that image in your head. So question number 12. Progress Harriers is concerned about social engineering by cyber criminal criminals. I don't think this would happen at our sports day. I don't think there are any cyber criminals working in the bushes. But Progress Harriers are concerned. And so it's your job to explain to them now, all right? What type of social engineering could take place in this competition? So think about your social engineering methods and get ready to write one down. You've got a couple of seconds. Okay, time's up then. So the first one is shoulder surfing. Obviously, they've made it so clear here, haven't they? Uh, where does it say it? It says it... I can't see it. Here, a desk is set up at the side of the events field. I mean, it, it lends itself to shoulder surfing. Somebody just walking past behind them, having a look over the shoulder at the data, the information, what's going on, uh, taking down notes of that. Multiple people doing cross walks behind and just taking down that information, that contact details of people. So yeah, shoulder surfing is one that I'd give you a mark. The other one is baiting. This is one that happens more often, and I've seen it happen myself, where somebody's just baiting them, trying to get information from them. Uh, or, or what, what what person was that? Who scored there? What what result was that? Did, did they win that that heat there? Did, did they do that? Can you tell me their name? That sort of thing. It's just baiting the person to give them the information that they're requiring. So they're the two. I explain one way progress areas could mitigate against the threats of social engineering. Okay? Three marks. This is a big one. So it's three marks. It is looking for an identification of the method. That will give you one mark. And then two marks for the explanation of how the method solves the problem. Okay, so I'm going to start off again with uh, do not award a mark for a hire a white hat hacker. So many people just put hacker. I've said it before. It's like verbal diarrhea. Hacker, hacker. And it's not, it's not an answer. So don't put what, hire a white hat hacker. Our school are not going to hire a white hat hacker to uh, check that your sports day results aren't lost. So just, just be thinking about the context here, okay? You're looking to stop any form of social engineering. And we're looking to see that you are looking at a way to stop the social engineering not manage the impacts of it. So it's about stopping it before it started. So you could have had, train all race officials on the types of social engineering. That would give you one mark. And then an explanation would be, so that they are better able to identify social engineering threats, one mark, and how to take countermeasures to prevent them, two marks. Make members of Progress Harry is aware of the possible consequences to the club of a social engineering threat. They will be more motivated to be vigilant Reducing the chance of them divulging confidential information. So that's about baiting, about training them to see how baiting might happen. 
Encourage members to report any email that might pose a threat. That's one mark. Enabling the club to take action. Two marks by informing all other members. Three marks. Physical screens that nobody else in the room. One mark. Physical physically keeps others away from the data would give you a mark. So a physical screen stops you from seeing it. So that they cannot see or steal it. You could have said something there where instead of being at the side of the track, they've got their back to a wall so that there can be nobody walking behind them or sitting beside them without them seeing it. That's fine as well. Think about the doctor's surgery. You go into a doctor's, their screen is always below the desk. You can't see the data on it. Usually we've got those screens where even when you try and look at the screen, it, it goes blank unless you're straight in front of it. And they're all things that they're doing to prevent social, uh, to mitigate against social engineering threats. And that's what it's looking for you to answer there. Question number 13. Identify one physical prevention measure and two logical prevention measures that progress harriers can take to protect this data. Okay, so one mark for physical. Biometric access device, so something that takes a fingerprint, retina scan, face scan, something biometrical from a user. Uh, a cable uh, would be another physical prevention measure. Lock the doors of the room that it's in and turn off the computer when it's not in use so that unauthorized access can't log on and do it. So physical, remember, are things that I can touch. Physical prevention measures are prevention measures that I can touch. I can physically see them and touch them. Logical are those, those digital prevention methods that, that I can't see but I know are there. So things like username and password, that would be a one mark for each of those. So if you put username and password, that could give you a mark. Uh, access rights, so that's tiered levels of access. Encryption. Secure backups, firewall, or antivirus are all logical security methods. Question uh, B is another one of those. Again, if you've made a mistake up here, then it could follow through here. So be very careful with the information that you write here. Choose logical prevention, chosen logical prevention measures. You're having to choose it there and describe it. Okay, and they're looking for you to be able to describe any logical prevention measure given above but must be reviewed in its own merits in relation to the description okay so it's got to be related to the description it says do not accept that with encryption data will be unreadable data is scrambled in encryption and not made unreadable so do not make the mistake of putting encryption makes the data unreadable because that wouldn't give you the mark so i'm not going to touch on those because there's a good long list there that you could have put but you need to have picked one of the above from what i said and then explain how that would protect the data. Moving on with progress harriers then, question 14. Progress harriers use a database to process data about the competition results. Describe one feature of a database that could help progress harriers enter data into their database. Two marks. Okay, so you could have had uh, you could have had validation. Okay, checks the data is of the correct type and is suitable to reduce data entry errors. That would give you two marks. You could have had forms. Data entered one record at a time, and it uses prompts or guides so that the user enters the right data into the different tables. You could have had the use of tables to organize data into groups. You could have had the use of columns so that the for the same type of data is added to the same column and therefore it is easier to read. You could have had rows uh, that the data is entered one subject, data subject at a time into organized rows to make it easier to see. The first mark is for identifying the feature and the second mark comes by explaining it. If no feature is identified and you've just put an explanation then you get no mark. So you need to make sure that you've stated the one feature that's in bold there and then explained it. Okay, question number B, or, or should I say 14B. Describe one feature of a database that could help progress harriers generate useful information from its database. Okay, so you're looking now at a, a feature within a database that takes the information and generates something and gives it as an output. There's only three of them available, and it wants you to state one of them and then explain them. So you could have Query. A query is used to search data using given criteria and find specific or equivalent information and it can be saved and used again. Okay. You could have had a report and that can be used to present information in easy to read format so that it can be printed out. Or you could have said 
print to generate a hard copy. And it says in the guidance, the first mark is given for identifying the feature. If no feature is identified, then no marks can be awarded. Do not accept to find information as an extension for a query. So you can't say a query. Okay, so it says in the guidance, first mark is for identifying the feature. If no feature identified, no marks may be awarded. Do not accept to find information as an extension for query. This must be a query to find specific or type or specific information. They don't want you to say, oh, I'll do a query and you can find some information. Like, they want you to be a bit more clear than that. And then it says equivalent to specific can be quite loose. Accept extract data according to the user's request as an example. So if you put in a query and you said, oh, it's used to extract data, uh, according to the user's request or is used to extract data according to the user's search, then that is okay. But what you can't do is just do a broad, oh, it's used to find data in a database. Okay? Okay. Explain two reasons why progress harriers would use a database rather than a spreadsheet to record event results, club event records, and the contact details of each competitor. You now need to be looking about a conversation between the two about what is a spreadsheet and what is a database. What I won't be able to accept is answers that suggest only database can use queries because that's simply not true. Spreadsheets can do other things that are similar to queries. And I can't accept answers about ease and speed. You can see a trend coming through here. So I need to see that you're going to have the opportunity here. You've got three marks per explanation. So you need to make your reasoning one mark and then explain two marks for each of these points. So six marks available, three for point one, three for point two, off you go. Okay, so we've got option one. We've got a relational database reduces data redundancy, smaller file size and less chance of data entry error. That'll give you three marks. Database use multiple tables linked by relationships to create complex queries would give you three marks. Database input forms and a switchboard can be used to simplify the, data, the user interface, three marks. And then progress harriers only record data, so they will not need to perform calculations, produce charts, or use complex functions, and therefore a spreadsheet is not appropriate. Okay, question number 15. When a club record is broken at a competition, a club record certificate is produced. The competitor name, event name, and date from the database are merged into a desktop publishing DDB certificate template. What presentation method is this? Don't get confused by that question. Please read it. What are they doing? They're taking data from one application software and they're using a different piece of application software to display it. What is it? It's a integrated document ding 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 that buzzword an integrated document okay explain two advantages of progress harriers using this to create their certificates if you get that answer wrong you lose four marks here okay that, that's how cut and dry this is all right so you need to be thinking about this and thinking through it clearly so you could have uh, reduced data entry errors, data for competitors is reliable as using the information directly from the database so it doesn't have human error where you jump from one to the other. It will take less time as the process can be automated, the document can be reused again and again. The source data can be easily changed if there is an error so therefore you change one and the other one updates. One setup it can be used by less skilled workers without the need for training, they can produce a document beyond their skills level because it will do it automatically. And a template can be populated with data from the database, which is far more efficient. Or the use of templates give a consistent layout and a house style because the fields are already pre-positioned. Okay? Brilliant. Right, last section now, and we're on to a new scenario. All right, we're nearly there. It's only got 20 questions, this exam paper. Uh, and so we'll go through this. So it says a large international charity collects data relating to its 500,000 donors. Those who give money to the charity. Remember, a donor is somebody who gives something. So I've had it before where people have done this question. They've read donor and they thought about blood donation. It doesn't mention blood donation at all. A donor is just somebody who gives something to the charity. And in this case, they give money. The data includes donor names, contact details, and, the don and if the donor pays on a monthly basis or not. The charity promotes the use of green energy, including the use of energy efficient home appliances such as TVs and lighting. Donors are encouraged to install solar panels on the, the roofs 
of their home. The charity collects data on the public opinion of the charity using the following. Surveys through the charity website, sending questionnaires by email and or through the post, social media, external sources such as market research conducted on the street by other companies. Market research is carried out on a weekly basis using surveys and questionnaires. The data from this market research is shared with other fundraisers. The data from the surveys and questionnaires is processed at the charity's head office and then stored on local servers. The charity uses the website to advertise the charity work it carries out and to sell branded clothing and gifts. The charity has asked the IT company to review the IT systems it has in place and identify the impact and consequences of potential cybersecurity attacks. All right, so there's the scenario. Let's have a look at question 16 then. The market researchers show presentations of the charity's work to the key people they talk to on the street. Potential donors are then asked to fill in a questionnaire online. Identify a suitable hardware device that could be used to complete the online questionnaire. Okay, so it says here, input devices in context as well as general devices are acceptable. All right, and the discussion needs to be around, the thought process needs to be around is where they're filling it in. And they've said that it's been filled in on the street. So you could have a tablet, a notebook, a smartphone, a touch screen, a laptop or a keyboard. Okay. What you cannot have is just a phone or a mobile phone or a mouse. Okay. They're too generic and they don't necessarily lend themselves to what they are. All right. So you can't have marks for those. A.2. The data from, re from each completed questionnaire is automatically sent to the charity head office. Identify one suitable connectivity requirement for the hardware device that you've chosen. And you could have mobile data, Wi-Fi, 3G data, 4G data, mobile broadband, or an NIC, a network interface card. All right. So, question B. Again, we're looking for the implication. We'll get one mark. And the explanation will get two. And the question is, explain one implication to the charity of having bias in the questionnaire. And the implication could be that the charity collects inaccurate data. And the explanation would therefore be, as the questions could be ambiguous, leading to poor choices being made, this would lead to inaccurate data. It could be that the charity could lose income because the data itself is collected will be invalid, leading to poor marketing decisions and the charity targeting the wrong potential donors. Or it could be that the reputation of the charity is damaged in some way, which will result in financial loss as the donors will stop making donations because they don't trust them. Question number 17. The charity has a database containing the details of its donors. Identify two data types that could be used to store this information. You can have any of the two data types that you are aware of. So that's text, alphanumeric, numeric, currency, date and time, limited choice, object, or logic, boolean, true, false, yes, no. Any of those will do. What you cannot accept is number. Do not put number as a data type. Number or letter B, 17B, for one of the data types above, justify your choice. Again, see, these are follow on marks, so you need to be careful that you don't make a mistake here. Chosen data type, you need to choose one of these data types and then justify it. You get two marks here, uh, so you've got two marks just for the justification. You don't get one of the marks for repeating what you've put above. All right, question number 18. It's a biggie, it's a 10 marker. So, the charity collects data about its 500,000 donors. Discuss the different ways in which the charity could use this data. Okay, so you could have, well, the charity could use names and addresses of donors to send out integrated documents appealing for donations, but it must check that the details are up to date to reduce errors and to maximize donations. The charity could use a spreadsheet to look for trends in the data to identify which donors are likely to give money again, helping to target market target marketing more accurately and increase donations. You could have postcodes could be used to look for patterns in the home location of donors and identify hot spots and cold spots. Action can be taken to increase donations in cold spots. Donation queries is another option. So database qu queries on the donations could be used to identify donors who pay on a monthly basis. These donors could be contacted by emailing, asking them 
to increase their monthly donation. Similarly, donors that do not make a donation every month could be asked to do so, therefore creating a steady income. Answers must be about how data can be put to use and not stored or managed. That's very clear, you'll get no marks for stating how the data could be stored or managed. To get in the top 7 to 10 marks, you need to explain the different ways in which the charity could use this data. This answer needs to be given in context. At the bottom of that mark band, so for 7 marks, you have more than one way and you explain each of those in depth. Dropping down the marks, if you want 6 marks, you need to be able to explain how one way is done and describe it. For four marks, you need to be able to explain one way in a, in a more weak way, so not much detail, but you have explained your explana your your one way. Uh, for one mark, you need to make a point, that's it. And for three marks, you need to be uh, explain, state more than one point, but give no explanation. So really, the explanations are the thing there that are holding the marks. Question number 19. State two types of environmental vulnerabilities that could affect the stored data. We're looking for environmental elements here. So you've got flooding, fire, lightning strikes, storm or natural disaster. You could also have things like tornado, volcanic eruption, uh, I don't know, twister, whatever it is that you're thinking in terms of a natural disaster, you would get a mark for that as well. Okay. Question number 20. Three marks available, same structure as all the other ones. You get one mark for the identification, okay? And you get the rest of the marks for the explanation. So explain the financial disruption that may occur to the charity after a cybersecurity attack. So money could be lost or stolen as the target of the attack charity, the target attacks the charity's funds, and then the information can steal the can be stolen from them. Uh, the charity might have to spend money to investigate the cybersecurity attack, which would impact on their income. Uh, it, they may have to spend money on recovering the data, or they may have to spend money on improving the data security. The charity might lose income due to loss of donations from donors who do not trust the charity anymore because their personal data was stolen. What I cannot accept is, is the uh, idea of ransom requests. So you can't put in there that uh, somebody might hold them to ransom, or... Uh, random uh, implications saying that they may get fined for GDPR breaches. I can't accept that either. Okay, last question, now 21. The charity collects data on the use of solar panels by its donors with their permission. A green energy supplier has asked the charity to share this information with them. Explain two reasons why the charity should say no to this data request. So you get one mark for reason and two for explanation. And there are six marks available. So that is three marks of point one and three marks of point two. So you could have that the data on the use of the solar panels could contain personal information and must not be shared without the permission of the donors as this would be illegal under the legislation of GDPR. The data might allow individual donors to be identified. So it, it is personal data and covered by the relevant legislation. So the charity will need the donor's permission. Or you could have that the data given to the charity was not for any other use by any other company. So the information given out illegally could result in them being sued as it is against the legal requirements. You're looking for the fact that the data was given to the charity for one use and not for this use. Remember, GDPR states that you must not use it for anything other than it was intended for. It says, do not accept answers that simply imply that green energy supplier is anything other than a green energy supplier. It says, do not accept answers that are based on misuse of data and other implications after it has been given away. So basically, what they don't want is for you to come up with a whirlwind theory that the green energy supplier is some terrorist organization that's trying to steal this data to launch an attack on someone. They want you to just take it at face value. A lot of times, students are trying to make up a story surrounding this. It's just the law. You're not allowed to share data without the original person's permission. It says... Acceptable answers may not be presented in the same order as the ones read out previously. For example, Data Protection Act GDPR states that data should be used for the stated purposes and you get a mark for stating that. So you don't have to write exactly what I said, but you do have to go along those lines. Hopefully that has been useful. That is the end of this uh, walking, talking mock and it's gone through the information. Your teacher will be able to provide you with this exam paper and the mark scheme for you to refer back to at a later date, should you wish. 
Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, you know where to find me.